Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our session um, for the live Shared Mobility Summit. Um, our session today is covering transit innovation in challenging times. Um, so our panelists will be discussing strategies um, for advancing transit projects um, and increasing ridership, um, both in challenging times um, and in non-challenging times. Um, so we'll hear um, quite a few different perspectives. Uh, my name is Dana Wall. I am the moderator today. I am an urban planner and designer with Street Plans. Um, we're a transportation planning, urban design, and architecture firm based in Miami. Um, and so I'm honored to kind of be moderating the conversation today. We're joined by Jerome Horn. Um, he is the Ridership Experience Specialist at Indigo. Um, Jerome, if you want to give a wave to everybody. <laughs> um, and then Jerome will be followed by Jeff Peel. Um, he is the Deputy Director of Transit Development Policy and Planning at New York City's Department of Transportation. And then we'll wrap up with Linda Lopez, um, who is the Advocacy Manager um, for the Active Transportation Alliance. Um, so each one of our panelists will be given about 10 minutes, um, and then we'll have 15 minutes of a moderated Q&A, and then 15 minutes of open Q&A. Um, and while everyone is presenting, um, you are able to um, add your questions either in the um, share, either in the chat or in the Q and A, um, and we will um, be getting to them and kind of reading them as we go and lining up uh, questions so we can have a good discussion um, following all the presentations. Um, so I think I'll open it up now to Jerome, and we can get started. All right. Thanks. Okay, well, can everybody hear me and see my screen? So thanks for having me today. Um, once again, my name is Jerome Horn, Ridership Experience Specialist at Indigo in Indianapolis. Um, primarily, my role focuses on making the, the user experience and the whole customer journey better uh, for riding transit. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to in Indianapolis. So first thing, uh, I want to get this out of the way. All of Indiana is not corn. Um, this is the center of our city, beautiful Monument Circle, which uh, is one of the best public spaces, uh, certainly in the state of Indiana, and I, and I personally think uh, around the country. Um, let's talk a little bit about the context of Indianapolis. So we are uh, currently a city of about uh, 900,000 people, 950,000, so almost a million. And uh, we, when, uh, we had a transit referendum in 2016, and before that process started, at the time we were the 14th largest city by population, but we ranked 86 in transit supply. In other words, 86 in terms of, of uh, revenue service hours of vehicles on the road. Uh, we were also uh, factored at that time to be the third most expensive when you look at uh, housing plus transportation as a percentage uh, of income. And on this slide, you can, you can see kind of geographically how large the city is. Um, and because we're not very dense, uh, you know, that presents a lot of geospatial challenges when it comes to providing transit and mobility um, in the city. Um, I always like to call this a ridiculous chart you can't see, but uh, this is referring to that the, the number when I said we were 86th in transit uh, revenue hours um, before, uh, before we started our, our transit referendum process. Uh, and so we had cities such as Omaha, Nebraska, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, running more service per capita on the street uh, than, we, than we do in Indianapolis. Uh, so that transit referendum in 2016 passed by about 60%. Uh, and that was a pretty strong indication that the public here wanted better options and recognized that transit uh, was key to access to opportunity and uh, economic development. One of the big things we focused on here is we never talked about uh, traffic congestion because we really don't have real traffic congestion in Indianapolis, um, but it was all about access to opportunity. Uh, I like to call this hot mess sexy lines, but what you're seeing are two different maps. Uh, the one on the left is our current system, and the one on the right is the system, uh, the re bus network redesign that uh, we will be implementing. Uh, what you need to know is that the colors on these lines uh, represent frequency. So a green route runs once an hour, uh, one that's blue is runs every 30 minutes and the red are ones that run every 15 minutes or better. So our current system, not a lot of frequent service and most of our service is only coming once an hour. We know that transit is only useful uh, if it's even there in the first place. 
Uh, we also, in the system that we're going to, you can begin to see more of a grid shape form out of the lines and definitely a lot more frequency uh, on the system having those core routes running through the dense walkable areas um, uh, at every 15 minutes or better. Now we're also implementing three BRT lines that really serve as our central spines, the red line, which we opened last year, and then we have our upcoming blue and purple line projects as well. So the, the BRT, really uh, the red line, which opened last September, it's a 13 mile corridor. We've got 28 stations, so station spacing about every half mile. And we really did some interesting things with this project. Um, you know, one of the biggest uh, new things for us and really around the, the country was the use of 60 foot battery electric buses. Uh, and so far we've had uh, some you know, mixed experiences with those, um, some challenges with range and charging, uh, but there are other benefits from reduced maintenance to being very, very quiet and not contributing to noise pollution. Um, the other big thing to highlight here is, is really the, the dedicated right of way that we were able to get on major streets in our city. Um, so particularly uh, the, the picture on the right shows uh, Meridian Street, which is our main north-south corridor in the city. And you know, we put in two center running uh, dedicated lanes. And that, that center running dedicated right of way uh, has been really instrumental in helping to make uh, this project successful and, and put the, the rapid in BRT. And so one big takeaway is, you know, I encourage cities, definitely, if you can get center running lanes and if it works for your project uh, to do that, because uh, less, the less conflicts with traffic, uh, the better. Uh, another thing we've been working on is implementing a new fare system. Uh, and we wanted to make fares fair. And so we are actually introducing kind of an account-based system that will use smart cards and uh, a mobile app if, if that's applicable to you. And we are introducing fare capping. Uh, fare capping sets kind of a daily, weekly, or monthly maximum that someone would pay. So let's say for a day, they pay $4. Once they hit that price, the rest of their rides and transfers uh, are free for the duration of that day. And we see this as a much more equitable way uh, to allow people to earn, uh, you know, earn some of the same benefits that people that would normally buy our monthly passes uh, could earn. Another thing we are really trying to focus heavily on is technology integration and, and figuring out how we can make that uh, work for the customer journey. So a lot of our newer buses are featuring these type of screens where we can relay public messaging, updates, uh, even route information um, about which route they're on and what stops are coming up next. Um, we're kind of in an interesting place in terms of uh, thinking about mobile applications and what we want to develop right now. We don't have our own standalone Indigo app. Uh, know a lot of transit properties out, uh, out there do. And we're thinking about you know, what already exists, uh, what third party uh, applications are out there today that are really good. And so, uh, you know, we kind of have this buy, develop, integrate uh, strategy, which really means that, you know, we're, we're looking at doing it all. We want to make sure that we have robust tools available to our riders, um, no matter which app they're using, whether it's the Transit app, Google Maps, our own custom app, um, and making sure that the, all that data is open and available. And then eventually, uh, we will build our own app to kind of control a local mobility as a service system. Or, um, and so that is uh, really what we're thinking in this regard. Another thing is that we're looking at um, the digital divide. We wanna make sure we're gonna do a technology audit um, because we really wanna understand um, these tools that we're developing, tools that our riders use. Um, who is that tool working well for? Who might, is it, who is it not working well for? And other strategies we can do to help bridge the gap so that we can make sure uh, all of our riders have uh, the most up-to-date information about our service. Mobility hubs uh, is another key focus for us. So. Uh, we are, uh, once we get this new fare system up and running completely, it will kind of serve as that basis to connect our bike share, scooters, uh, car share systems together. Um, in Indianapolis, we actually had the nation's first all electric uh, car share system, that was Blue Indy. Unfortunately, Blue Indy uh, is going to be leaving us this month, but we have about 90 plus uh, electric car charging stations in the ground in the city of Indianapolis. And so there's been a lot of uh, thought and conversation about, you know, uh, having that infrastructure is very valuable and, and it would be a shame to rip it all out. So we're thinking about strategies to um, uh, at least Indigo at the transit agency level to figure out how we can uh, tap into that system and what we could possibly do to help provide more mobility options. Uh, wayfinding, another huge area this kind of shows one of our uh, not, uh, not so great bus stops. It's uh, out in the middle of nowhere. If you could see the ground, there's barely a sidewalk there. Uh, 
Um, but really we're working at uh, looking at uh, how to redesign our bus stop signage. We're looking at other signage around the city and our system uh, because we want the, the system to be legible uh, and navigable uh, really in a way that even if you, uh, you know, don't have access to a smartphone or, or maps that you can kind of really get enough information from our wayfinding system to, to know where you are or we solidify uh, something that maybe you're seeing in the digital, digital world. Uh, we started working on some of this new wayfinding when we built uh, our, our Redline BRT last year and we're going to continue refining that work uh, uh, to make the system more legible as we go along. Uh, another big takeaway is meeting people where they are. So uh, we know that traditional public meetings are not the best way to engage folks and so we developed a program called our, our Transit Ambassadors and these are volunteers that we recruit and train, most of which are our regular riders on the system. And they really serve as an extension of our public affairs uh, department by being kind of our eyes and ears on the ground. They will actually ride the buses. They'll go to our, our downtown transit center. They'll go to community events and other stakeholder engagements, sometimes with Indigo staff. Uh, and this has been a really great thing that works well for, um, you know, our riders have been very appreciative of having people come to them uh, rather than, you know, saying come to this public meeting from six to eight on a Wednesday, because we know that, uh, you know, sometimes that is it's just not the best way to engage folks and that, um, you know, we really want to make sure we're reaching um, all, all segments of the population. Uh, so I want to just uh, highlight a little bit of what we've been doing with our, our COVID-19 response. We've been implementing most of the strategies that other transit systems have done where we, we uh, suspended fares, we introduced rear door boarding, we blocked off the area where uh, up front where the operator was and really stepped up our, our, route, our, our cleaning routine. Um, one thing that we did do recently, though, is we actually reinstated fares um, on Monday of this week after the installation of some plexiglass shields um, that our, some of our operators had uh, this idea, and we were able to kind of do a quick build on that and turn those out um, in, in, a, in a very fast manner. The other part of our response is focusing on, uh, since we're running on a reduced schedule, what could we do with some of our excess vehicles, and so we've been using some of our paratransit vehicles to help deliver food and transport um, uh, different supplies from different areas around the city. Uh, we also had an existing microtransit pilot that we had just started uh, a few weeks before the, the pandemic was, uh, was among us, and we've been repurposing those vans to also do the same thing, making food deliveries and, and helping out people in parts of the city uh, that, that are considered transit deserts. And then finally, uh, we decided to partner with Uber. Um, and this, the purpose of this was to allow people to uh, travel uh, one round trip per day to and from the workplace uh, for essential workers only. And part of the, the thinking behind this is that we, we knew that we had limited capacity on our bus and limited spacing since we're encouraging social distancing. So we wanted to give uh, other people an option, people an option um, to get to places um, that maybe is not so well served by the bus. We've had about 600 trips thus far. We're planning on doing an exit survey to capture more demographic data about who's riding. And um, from this partnership, we're gonna use that to inform our future mobility projects. I think one of the biggest things we're interested in is how many people are using these Uber trips to go to places that are not currently very friendly or accessible uh, by our existing fixed route system and what we can do moving forward with that. So that's it from me. Uh, once again, you can reach me at uh, jhorn at indigo.net. Uh, there's my office number and I'm gonna transition, uh, stop sharing my screen and transition back to the next person up. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Peel. I'm with the New York City Department of Transportation. Uh, and I was telling my fellow panelists as we were getting ready to come on, I will never complain about having to lug a projector and laptop to community board meetings ever again after dealing with tech issues here, construction outside my window. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the same camp Jerome as right now. So bear with me one second while I uh, learn to navigate last minute at my wife's computer and trying to figure out how to share, share my screen. So hang on one second.
Bear with me while I find the full screen mode. There we go. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna talk to you today about the 14th Street Transit and Truck Priority Street Pilot Project. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll just call it the busway for short. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the background of the project and some of the early results that we've seen since we've implemented. Um, and then I'll, I'll free up time to answer any questions you have about the project and any of the lessons we've, we've learned from what we've done here. Uh, this project really comes, uh, the genesis of this is really with the, the L train tunnel closure um, that was scheduled to happen um, a couple of years ago. Um, the, the work was, pardon me, the work was really slated to, why is this freezing? Jeff, if you go back to where you were, I think it'll, uh, it was fine back in the previous. So if you just go back to the former screen. Can you see this now? Not Ruby? yet. No, not yet. Okay. Tell you what, if you want to skip to the next presenter, I will get back on my my iPad and see if I can make it work on there. My okay. Apologies here. Sorry about that. I will I'll get it working on that. Okay. All right. So I'll be going next. <laughs> Let's see. Where is my slideshow? Okay. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Linda Lopez. I'm an advocacy manager at the Active Transportation Alliance. And today I'll be talking about uh, Fair Fair Chicagoland and also taking the time to uh, discuss public transit and the impact COVID-19 has had on our city and region. So for any of you that want to take a look at our fair fares report, this is uh, the link online and I, along with my coworker, uh, Julia Garrisomenko at Active Trans, were the two co-authors of this report, uh, which was released last fall. So just to give you a sense of the impact of COVID-19 on public transit, CTA ridership system-wide fell 75 to 80% in March. Um, we saw greater decline on rail versus buses. Uh, Metro or commuter rail has seen ridership fall by 97% since shelter in place. Pace our suburban buses has seen ridership decline about 70% on fixed routes. And there's some important equity considerations to keep in mind as we talk about public transit and uh, what the recovery phase will look like. Bus ridership on south side routes remain higher than on routes running downtown on the, or on the north side, speaking to racial disparities in ridership and who can work from home. Uh, CTA data reveals that south side neighborhoods with higher ridership are the same areas with significantly higher rates of COVID-19 deaths. Um, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning recently revealed data that shows essential workers in Chicago are disproportionately people of color and lower income communities with higher concentrations in the south and west sides of the city. Hey, Linda, are you sharing yes. your slides? Oh, I am, but let me try again. Sorry, everyone, tech difficulties. <laughs> Okay, so ah. I'll show you what you missed. Um, so this is the link to the Fair Fair Chicago Land Report if you all want to check it out online. Um, and this is just the data that I was sharing. All right. So just to give you a sense of some of the transit advocacy efforts um, that we're undergoing just based on some of this data and also just based on the issues people have been raising around uh, the needs around public transit at the moment. Um, we, we, the Active Transportation Alliance was calling for rear door boarding on CTA, which was implemented in earlier April. Uh, we've also been calling for free transit. While CTA hasn't implemented uh, free fares, they have been transitioning to um, installing rear door fare card readers on the buses. Um, so there's no current fare enforcement um, while they transition all the buses. 
Uh, we've been calling for transit worker protections, such as proper PPE for operators, hazard pay, and other analysis of workplace safety to make sure that people doing their jobs are kept safe. Uh, there's a need to analyze ridership data to ensure a frequent service on high ridership routes and other areas with large number of essential workers, such as the west and south sides, and we're starting to see some of that data come out. And we continue to advocate for policies such as masks for riders to ensure safety for riders and operators, which uh, will become even more crucial as um, our cities and states uh, transition from shelter in place. So the larger question, how does fair fares fit into this current advocacy, uh, which is something that we've been thinking about in the last, uh, last few months. So this is the cover of our report, which was released in the fall. So just to, so before I, I answer that question, uh, just to give you a little bit more background on the Fair Fair Chicago Land Report, um, it was building off the back on the bus report, which was released in 2017 by the Active Transportation Alliance. Um, and this, this report offer recommendations for speeding up our city's buses, such as fare capping, transit signal priority, uh, bus only lanes. And um, in the implementation of this report among community partners, cost barrier to transit became, uh, came out as a significant issue. And this served as a catalyst for further evaluating, evaluating cost, cost barriers to transit um, in the city of Chicago. And in addition to this report serving as the foundation for fair fares, there was also a growing movement around fair fares nationwide. New York City implemented their fair fares program in 2018, which has been rolled out in phases since then. Uh, Portland, San Francisco, Denver, Seattle have different versions of discounted fares for low-income residents, which we feature in our report uh, as case studies. So just to go into some of the development of fair fares, um, last summer we hired canvassers focused on the west and south side communities as well as southern Cook County to collect survey responses to gather feedback on cost barriers to transit um, and other related issues and the Great Cities Institute at UIC helped us develop some of those survey questions. We were able to collect close to 700 responses and the survey responses revealed clear need for addressing cost barriers to public transportation in our region for a low, in low income residents. Um, and these are some of the survey responses, uh, and these are particularly hiding, highlighting responses of residents uh, making $25,000 or, or below. Uh, so 93% of people that responded under this income bracket said that they would be more likely to use trains or buses if the cost was lower. 60% um, said that in the past year, their family member had been unable to afford train or bus fares. 80% um, of respondents said they have used transit to access their jobs. So thinking about how transit um, connects people to their places of work and how we can think about alleviating, alleviating some of those barriers that um, people are expressing through this survey. And this is some other uh, data from the survey. So these are still highlighting the people making $25,000 or less. Um, so these are showing that some people indicated that uh, they were they faced barriers to being able to afford transit when trying to access medical care. 19% 19, 19 shared that very often they were prevented from getting to medical care by the cost of train or bus fares. So thinking of the significance of even 1% being able, unable to get medical care because of cost of transit um, is still significant. Um, in addition to the survey, we also interviewed transit riders throughout the city um, and the county, in the surrounding counties just to get more of a sense of what people are experiencing, more firsthand accounts. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Yolanda Cruz. She lives in Jeffrey Manor on the south, uh, far south side of the city of Chicago, and she's a home caregiver in Hyde Park. And she takes the bus to, to work every day. And once in the neighborhood where she visits different homes, she also takes the bus to be able to visit all those homes. Um, and I asked her how she, um, how, she get, how she pays for transit, and she says that she buys a weekly pass for $28. Um, and she, she said that while a monthly pass would make sense for her because she travels every day, um, the cost of $105 for a monthly pass just is very inaccessible to her. And she says she'd rather pay more over the course of a month and have to pay up front uh, that much money. So something like fare capping um, would really benefit people like Yolanda that have to make kind of those intricate decisions to be able to um, access the places they need to go. Um, this is Isabella Barca. She lives in the back of the yard neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. And 
Um, her family gets around using public transportation. They get their groceries, their essential goods by public transportation. Um, and she says that sometimes uh, her mom, to be able to use um, her venture card, um, she sometimes has to take money from their rent to be able to add some more money to be able to get around. So she says that something like discounted fares would be really beneficial for her family. So um, her mom wouldn't have to make the decision to be to have to take some of the rent money to be able to take the bus um, or the train to get somewhere they need to go. Um, and this is Maricela Guerrero. She lives on the southwest side of the city and she works part time at the Nabisco plant um, on the far south side as well. And she takes the bus to get to work um, as well as her husband um, who lives on the north side of the city as well. And sh she said that the buses work well for her. She wishes they um, were a little cheaper, but she says it doesn't it doesn't prove a huge barrier to her right now. Um, she says she doesn't choose to uh, pay for a monthly pass, again, kind of reiterating the same narrative that we were seeing, um, that $105 is just ridiculous for a monthly pass. Um, and she says if, if it was 50% uh, discounted fare, um, so about $50, she says she would definitely choose to buy a monthly pass instead of paying as she goes. Um, so that was kind of the development of Fair Fares, the survey and the transit rider stories. Um, so these are the seven recommendations that came out of all our research. Um, so th the first recommendation that we started off with, which is the discounted fare program, um, which was the top priority and all these other priorities came out just with our additional conversations with people, our additional research. Um, and some of these are very applicable to what's happening at the moment, um, creating a reduced fare transit program. Our second one was reassessing the fare box recovery ratio, thinking about the burden that places on transit agencies, um, integrating fare collection. So thinking about how we make it seamless for people traveling between CTA, our, our suburban buses, PACE, um, and our commuter rail metro. How, how, how can we make it more seamless for people to tra transfer from one to the other? Uh, we called for testing the South Cook Fair Transit project, which is um, a project that local organizers have been pushing for years to uh, create faster, more frequent, um, more affordable service for the South side of Chicago. Um, decriminalizing fare evasion, which is uh, pretty significant in thinking about who is impacted by um, criminalizing fare evasion is something really important for us to highlight as a recommendation. Um, and given the number of people that discuss monthly passes being really expensive, um, we, fair capping came out as also a prominent recommendation in our report. And our last one was free fares for youth. Uh, while we put it in our report, there are also a lot of other people in the city in different spaces that have been bringing up free fares for youth for years. Um, so it's something that has been talked about. Um, whether it hasn't been it hasn't been a prominent campaign at the moment, it has come up. In conversations among um, different groups in the city. Uh, so just to close off, um, as we started to take a look at fair fares and how it fits into what is happening at the moment around public transit um, with job losses and housing insecurity in our communities, policies like fair, uh, free fares and discounted fare um, become more prudent to address immediate needs of low-income residents. Um, when I was having a conversation with one of our community partners a few weeks ago, uh, thinking about, well, people are trying to navigate unemployment. They don't have the money to think about um, being able to pay a couple dollars to get on the bus. So thinking about how we can alleviate the burdens people are facing uh, in their communities right now and um, facilitating movement for people at this time. Um, there's an immediate need to reevaluate the fare box recovery as ag agencies will be unable to meet this for the foreseeable future. Um, and also just thinking about public transit as a central priority for a recover recovery phase and ensuring it continues to be a public good, um, even though uh, it faces immense challenges, thinking about the conversation around how you can socially distance on public transit and um, a lot of different conversations around public health. It's important for us to continue seeing public transit as a, a core part of uh, our strong cities and also a core part of making sure people are able to move around. Uh, so that's, that's it for now. Um, you can email me, there's my email, and I'm happy to take any questions during Q&A.
Okay, this is Jeff. I'm gonna try again here. I switched to my iPad to see if this works. Uh, when I tried it before, it started at the back of my deck. So uh, don't peek when you see the ending before you see the beginning. I'll try to get this to, to work here. for some lost time here uh, as I will see my screen. I'll take that as a yes. Um, someone message me or opinion if, if not. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, th this project really came out of the L-Train closure uh, that was slated uh, to, to be wrapping up actually now. The, the work actually is wrapping up. This was a result of the Superstorm Sandy uh, flooding of all the East River tunnels. Uh, the connect Manhattan and, uh, to Brooklyn and to Queens. Um, the Canarsie tube was was the tunnel that connected the L train uh, between Brooklyn and Manhattan. The L line, um, unlike many of our other lines, doesn't have interlining and then it doesn't connect to other so share share track with other subway lines. Uh, it doesn't share maintenance facilities in Manhattan. It doesn't connect to other lines at all um, in, in such a way that it can't get to. Uh, the trains can't get to their, their maintenance facility. So the severing of this line uh, was hugely detrimental for this part of uh, Brooklyn, which served about 400,000 riders a day, 225,000 of which uh, connected between Brooklyn and Manhattan. On the Manhattan side, 50,000 riders a day traveled between 1st and 8th Avenue. Uh, pretty, high, pretty high ridership for this, this part of the city, and it's only been growing for the past few years. So we we took this on not just as a, uh, a Brooklyn problem, as a, as a Manhattan 14th Street problem, or even a transit problem. This was really a regional transportation crisis we were, we were facing if we didn't get our, our alternative service plan correct. So uh, this unprecedented problem took an unprecedented level of, of coordination between uh, us at the New York City DOT and our partners at the MTA and New York City Transit. Uh, we, we did that based on our decade plus experience uh, building out our select bus service program. Uh, select bus service is New York City's version of BRT, so I like to say BRT Lite. It's really it's enhanced bus service and transit priority. It's found on 16 high ridership and high frequency routes throughout all five of our boroughs. Uh, we're really making strides to, to improve the, the performance, the on time performance, the, uh, the reliability and the speeds of buses throughout the city. Um, so what we developed with our partners at, at uh, MTA was really a, a multi-agency, multimodal alternative service plan uh, that encompasses uh, a lot of different ways for folks to get around due to this displacement throughout the city. Uh, to figure it out, we spent about two and a half years doing the planning and doing the analysis. We did well over 100 community workshops and meetings. We did very exhaustive traffic modeling, both at the, the micro local level, looking at block to block kind of travel patterns. There's also the, sort of the regional context there as well. We knew we had to be incredibly thorough with our work, both our planning and our, our traffic analysis work. Uh, and there was a lot of eyes on this project. Uh, it really paid off when we got sued um, and the, the project sort of would fit and start, fits and starts here um, before ultimately moving forward. Uh, the result was really, a, a, in my in my mind, uh, a, a huge win in, in coordination between multiple agencies, not just us at the DOT, but all our all our sister agencies, uh, and parks and NYPD and, and even sanitation and other agencies um, throughout the city, uh, as well as uh, building a uh, fostering a better relationship with with MTA. Um, it took a huge huge lift on us and engulfed most of our work programs for the better part of two years there. Um, so back to 14th Street, which was certainly part of, as I mentioned, 50,000 um, L train riders who travel underneath 14th Street were suddenly going to be displaced, bubbling to the surface, joining with the 27,000 daily and 14 bus riders there, uh, second busiest bus route in Manhattan, and second slowest in all of New York City. Uh, there was a lot to fix on 14th Street leading up to this. We, we've known this for, for, for about 10 years, uh, knowing that this, was, this corridor was ripe for, for a transformation. Uh, particularly from a transit perspective, but also from a safety perspective. There were seven vision zero priority intersections. Uh, it was a busy multi-use commercial corridor and there was no commercial loading there. So we had rampant double parking 
which only exasperated the safety issues and congestion facing the buses. Uh, we knew we had a lot of work to do there. And what we didn't want to have happen was the L train um, closure not allow us to, to leave something better behind on, the, on this corridor here. We wanted to make the most of this crisis we were facing, come out the, the back end uh, with a better, better street as a result. Uh, so what we did is, is we responded with uh, our busway. Um, on the periphery of the corridor, we used, we pulled from our existing select bus service toolkit and used a mix of both curbside and offset from parking bus lanes where the, where the ridership was lower, where, where the congestion was lower. And the core of 14th Street, where we were connected to most of the major institutions, most of the transfer locations to other subway routes, uh, we really limited access there almost exclusively for the bus. Uh, we looked at an additional 50,000 square feet of pedestrian area. So folks who decided, you know what, I want to hop on this bus, no matter how frequently you're running, I'm just going to walk between Union Square and say 6th Avenue. We wanted to be able to accommodate that because it's already a pretty congested pedestrian corridor. Uh, we looked to innovate things and experiment with, with things that we hadn't done before, like the plastic bus, bus bulbs to extend the sidewalks for those of you who who aren't familiar, there's a company, Zicla, a Spanish company that makes these modular sidewalk extensions for bus stops. Uh, we were looking to implement those uh, far and wide across the corridor. Uh, and by winter 2018, we had almost all of our markings in. We were getting ready to install the bus borders. Our partners in New York City Transit uh, and we're, were almost done with installing their off-board fare payment machines they were putting in to speed up the boarding of the bus. Uh, we felt really confident in our plans. We were certainly nervous for the L train to close and the disruption it was going to cause. We felt, at least on 14th Street, we felt we were going to be ready. Um, and then our, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, commissioned a study to find a different way to do the work. Um, and he went forward with that, shutting down the, the shutdown, if you will. He halted the, the closure of the tunnel, uh, choosing a different method in which to do the repair work in the tunnel, which didn't require the closure. Um, it, was, it was unexpected for us. Um, time will tell if that was the right decision to make, uh, going with this uh, untested uh, construction methodology. Uh, but the work wrapped up last week with minimal disruption to, to travel for folks of nights and weekends. Uh, it, it, we'll, we'll see where that lands in the, in the test of time there. But uh, once, we, once we caught our breath, um, we remember there were still a lot of issues on 14th Street that we wanted to address, historical issues that, that needed to be fixed, um, uh, issues with, with traffic congestion and safety and, and bus performance. Uh, so we dusted off all our notes from, from our traffic analysis. We dusted all, all our notes off from the, from the community outreach we did. Uh, we looked back at that in particular. We, we heard loud and clear from 14th Street residents. They were very concerned about local access being able to get groceries dropped off or uh, to have uh, elderly folks dropped off at the doctor's offices or to get rides from for hire vehicles um, that they, they were used to using. Um, the residents on the adjacent side streets were very, very concerned about spillover traffic. Now, they're more reasonable folks. We talked about them in all our meetings. Um, understood that there would be some consequences to the alternate closure and they were willing to, to accept some of that. The part that really bugged them though was the trucks. So 14th Street is a major truck through corridor. They were very concerned about displaced box trucks and 18 wheelers going down their, their mostly quiet residential side streets, and, which is a, is a fair comment. Uh, and we certainly, you know, we're hearing loud and clear that the 14th Street bus riders uh, were concerned um, uh, about making sure that, that we implemented something and they got them moving faster that they were very excited about. Uh, so we looked back at our modeling, we, we looked at the, the markings that were in place, we made some design changes, um, and we made some policy changes here. We knew that the, the buses were going to run about 30% faster, which is a huge improvement uh, for bus travel times, particularly in, in Manhattan. Uh, we looked at the truck issue in particular, and we, knew, we found that trucks were about 12% of the vehicle mix running through on the corridor. Uh, and we realized that we, we could allow them to continue to do that, not disrupt the commerce, not disrupt uh, the, the residential side streets that were adjacent to this, um, and really not have a detrimental, a huge detrimental impact on, on the quality of the bus service that we were hoping to implement. Uh, so that's what we, were, what we decided to do. We still have some very unhappy folks 
some, some of the side streets and some of the residents uh, who were still very litigious about the whole project. Uh, but we decided to move forward with that, sort of its first of its kind, mixing transit and trucks in the same uh, priority corridor. So how it works is we kept the same demarcations of, of the, the extents of the busway uh, that we had prepared for the L train. Uh, kept the same local access, but enhanced the, the, the curb regulations here. And the, for those of you who work on these types of projects, um, just the, the pro tip from what we do here in New York City, updating your curb regulations is really the secret sauce, uh, particularly on corridors where you have rampant double parking or congestion issues. Oftentimes, that could be one of the biggest single factors you could do ahead of, ahead of markings and, and bus lanes. Um, so how this works is folks can still drive on 14th Street. So the, the, it was misrepresented somewhat. Um, we didn't want to encourage driving, but it was misrepresented that we banned cars on 14th Street. You can still drive on 14th Street if you need to. If you need to get to drop off someone at, at a doctor, you need to uh, have a four-hour vehicle drop you and your kids off at, at your building or, or pick up a package, um, you can do that. But you have limited access points on 214th Street and you have to make the next right turn on. Uh, this is something that the King Street in Toronto has experimented with, with their light rail line has, and we saw good results from that, so we borrowed that from that. Uh, you can drive on the corridor, but it's only for a block or two and you have to get off. There's no more, no more through movement there, uh, which really caused the, the amount of vehicles on the corridor to diminish quite a bit. So uh, after a bunch of fits and starts with, with legal wrangling here, we actually launched this on October 3rd of last year. Uh, we knew it was gonna be a success. We knew the bus was gonna move faster. We were pretty confident and there was gonna be calamity on the side streets. Um, we crossed our fingers and uh, even though we expected good results, we were, we were blown away with how successful it was. The bus, buses were flying down 14th Street uh, the side streets uh, for the first few weeks were not only not congested, they were, they were practically empty. Um, it's evident in the, the tweet in the lower, lower portion of the screen here. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were quite thrilled with the results and, and folks immediately started asking, day two of this, this is great, come do it on X corridor, bring it to my street. When are you coming to Brooklyn with this? When are you coming to Queens with this? Why is it just Manhattan? So, uh, it's not often that you get the New York Times congratulating you on, on your placemaking ability with a transit project, but we were quite, quite thrilled to see that. Uh, the question for us and for a, a lot of people who live around there, though, is uh, aside from the, the Twitter sphere accolades, how is it really working? And, and with that, we had promised the community we would do quarterly uh, progress reports. It is a pilot project. We are monitoring it to see how it's working. Um, we're still continuing to do that today. But the, the first snapshot we took, uh, October and November data, we saw 36% improvement in travel time. So this is five minutes faster between 3rd Avenue and 8th Avenue. This is you know five to seven blocks, the bus is moving five minutes faster, still making the same stops. But that's how slow that bus was going before, uh, this able to make that kind of jump. And in a distance, it ought to be able to travel in almost five minutes anyways. Uh, we looked not only at 14th Street, but we looked at the larger corridor. Um, we saw the corresponding complementary bike lanes on 12th and 13th had huge jumps in riderships. Um, City bike, our bike share system, had huge spikes in ridership in the area compared to year over year. Um, we also looked honestly at the travel times. We were quite, quite clear with the community that we did expect travel times to go up and, and additional traffic volume on those side streets. We did not want to shy away from that. We wanted to maintain the public trust because we knew that would actually be true. We thought it was within a, a marginal level uh, that we could accept. Uh, what we saw was about a minute uh, change from end to end, First Avenue to Ninth Avenue on most of the adjacent side streets, which was below what we had modeled and, and fairly, access, uh, fairly successful in that. Uh, the stat that's most impressive to me and that I am most excited about is the 6,000 daily new riders we've added each weekday. Uh, much like the rest of the country, bus, buses have been hemorrhaging riders for years here in New York City. In only a few months, we reversed the last five years of decline. So that is, that is something that I'm most excited about. I think you know, that alone, if we can 
take a lesson there and expand that throughout the city is, is where some of the trade-offs that we do have to make for this, even where we do make those trade-offs. So we are still working to improve the experience for residents on adjacent streets, improve the curb access for folks who live and work on these types of corridors when we do these projects. Um, so I talked about how it works. Um, uh, we'll talk in a second about the mechanics and how it happened. I'm a firm believer in this, the three-legged stool model uh, of project implementation. And for, for projects of this magnitude, it really, it really takes everyone getting on board and getting aligned and getting behind this. Uh, we had strong agency partners in MTA and us with the DOT and uh, our, our partners at NYPD were huge in making the enforcement of this very successful. Uh, we had visionary leadership from Mayor de Blasio, who ultimately made the decision to move forward with this, to the city council members, the state assembly, state senate, uh, local community boards who got behind this and were supportive. Uh, and last but not least, the dedicated advocates, Transportation, Transportation Alternatives, Writers Alliance, uh, Transit Center, all worked hard on, on helping push this in the public sphere, um, helping give a little, a little wind beneath ourselves there to move this forward. Uh, so what's next? Everyone wanted to know and still wants to know where the next busway is coming. Uh, we have a couple corridors in mind. We've, we've heard folks loud and clear. There's stuff that we want to move forward with. We want to uh, build on what we've done on 14th Street, much like we built on our select bus service program to come up with 14th Street. We want to take what we've done on 14th and build on that. Uh, a lot of that fed into our Better Buses Action Plan. So in 2019, we launched 14th Street, but we also launched, launched uh, 20 other transit priority projects throughout the city. We had much more on tap for 2020 that has since been put on hold because of COVID, but our Better Buses Action Plan has a goal of improving bus fees by 25% in, in the city. Uh, we do want to hold true to that. We do want to move that forward. We want to take lessons of what we learned in responding to the L train crisis in, in on 14th Street and apply this to other projects. Uh, I, I think my, the biggest takeaway in that for me is, is build on what you do well and, and, and ratchet it up and take it to that next level and you'll succeed. Uh, so with that, I think uh, I will turn it back over to questions. Thanks. Cool. Thanks everybody. Um, really good thorough uh, presentations about what you guys have all been working on. Um, I think if we wanna stop uh, doing the screen share and just put our videos on, so um, we can just have more of a human component here. <laughs> for the Q&A. Um, so we have about 13 minutes left. Um, I think originally we wanted to leave a little bit more time for questions, so I'm just gonna get to, um, you know, I think I'm gonna prioritize just one or two of the questions that um, was asked by the participants. And then if no one else has any other questions, I can kind of go off of, um, you know, riff a little bit. On so um, this is a question for Linda. Um, what platforms or tools do you use to interact and keep in contact with residents? Yeah, um, and I think that's that's evolved just given the the, com the current circumstances. Um, but during the Fair Fairs report, one of the ways that we were trying to keep in touch with people and, and reach people, I think for one, I think the first step was trying to figure out how to reach people, particularly people that um, aren't typically reached by like transportation planning or other sort of planning. Um, so we had to get really creative with how we were reaching people. And that's where the hiring of the canvassers came in, people from their own neighborhoods, people that would know uh, like where they could find people, uh, what bus stops were popular so they could talk to people. Um, so that was the key thing, at least in the development of the Fair Affairs Report. In terms of how to keep up with people, um, I think just meeting people where they're at is really important. So I was pretty cognizant of asking people, like, how do you like to communicate? Do you like phone calls? Do you, do you mind if I text you or if I send you something? Um, and it helped that I'm bilingual in Spanish because um, some of the participants that we were reaching um, were uh, monolingual Spanish speakers. So that was also important in thinking about how you're being accessible language wise. And um, I, I think in terms of just continuing to keep in touch with the people that supported the work is um, trying to, you, I mean, at the moment, phone calls, it seems like the best way because emails, just thinking about who, um, who uses emails for communication, it's not always everyone that you want to be reaching, particularly uh, the most marginalized communities uh, might not be the same kind of methods of communication. So those are some things that um, we considered as we were um, reaching people and I think this current moment calls for 
just being a lot more um, okay with doing more phone calls with people and connecting with more community partners in that way. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I actually was mistaken. We're going until 2.15. So all those questions that you guys are holding back, just let them go. Um, so I'm going to propose a question um, that's just a little bit more timely. Um, you know, so we have a bus network redesign. We have um, a campaign for fair fares and, you know, other objectives. And then also um, kind of a, a quick build a little bit relatively you know, to permanent projects, um, a quick build bus project. And um, I'm curious to know how the work that you three have done um, has provided some sort of framework or foundation um, for implementing projects now, um, especially during this crisis and in what ways specifically they've been useful. Um, you know, kind of pointing to this idea that maybe cities and transit agencies who are doing this work um, kind of have a framework to be able to act a little bit faster in the future. So, you know, Jeff able to actually roll out more busway projects um, or Jerome, you know, implement maybe the bus network redesign a little bit faster or, um, yeah, so just if you could each talk about kind of how you might be using that previous work now or how it's useful um, to, for rapid response. Yeah, I'll go first from a transit agency perspective at Indigo. Um, you know, one thing that the current reality uh, did for us was helping us learn that we could uh, speed up our pick process. So that's how we assign our operators to the different work that they're going to do, the different routes they're going to run. So uh, at the beginning of this, we had to sort of scramble to make a modified schedule and, and get all of that work reassigned. And we were able to do that in a matter of days where it normally takes, you know, a few weeks. Uh, so uh, also, just uh, communications, crisis communication. Um, for us at the agency, we you know had some procedures in place, but um, they just weren't maybe up to up to where we would like would have liked them to be. So we spent uh, quite a bit of time um, kind of developing a new SOP, a new standard for communication with our riders to make sure that you know everything's crossed and checked, and that we can get information out sooner. Um, in terms of you know the work that we've already been doing, um, you know in a for us with our bus network redesign, we were supposed to implement that this June and it's been postponed to next June. Uh, but that gives us uh, an opportunity to uh, make sure that we kind of vet all, everything, even though we've done extensive outreach and it's been approved by our board. But obviously uh, post COVID or then in the new reality, we're not sure um, you know, if some of those routings will still make sense. We'll have to monitor and look at you know, travel uh, patterns and demand. Um, what we do feel though is that uh, essentially, you know, we know that you know we're, we're currently running service uh, for essential workers and our routes that were already frequent and our highest performing routes are still uh, our highest performing routes and where we're putting in the 15 minute service in the future is in the densest most walkable parts of the city so we anticipate a lot of that to uh, remain intact through next year nice so i'll go next i think uh you know in flush times when things are well and and agencies are, are, are doing all they can do. We, we build stuff out in capital, but we build it out in concrete. We build full BRT with stations and full level boarding. I think when resources are tight um, and you want to do things quicker, we've certainly done that with select bus service program and, and have implemented some really fantastic transit priority without uh, full capital build outs. And I think 14th Street, what we did there, it, the magic of that really it's it's the signage and it's the enforcement more than any wonderful street design and markings I, you know we adapted what we had planned for for the l train uh, to make it work i would love to go back with a clean clean slate and put in new markings there and i think the lesson there is going forward we're looking at, at, at what we can do quick and nimble the the tactical urbanism tactical transit experiments what can we do with our extra z club bus borders or the with cones or just putting bus only markings down and not painting them red and putting in some signage the sort of quick and nimble things that we can do uh, that aren't as effective but we need to be moving the needle to get the stuff in quicker so it's it's weighing those trade-offs and i think we we have enough experience in our sbs program and, and certainly for 14th street uh with with shifting traffic elsewhere 
um, that uh, I think we're, we're, there's lots of stuff we're talking about doing as the city starts to, to come back to life. Mm -hmm. um, just to be brief, um, in terms of how some of our work has been helpful in addressing what is happening right now, I think the Fair Fair report, um, I think, has served as a good foundation in thinking about some of the issues that I think have only been amplified in this moment, particularly with, um, I guess, uh, just addressing the different barriers that communities are facing right now with unemployment, uh, rent insecurity, and all the different things that um, have made it more dif difficult for people to just be able to afford their daily um, necessities. So the Fair Fair report really I think set the foundation for us in thinking about, I mean, these barriers existed already. Uh, people have brought up barriers to cost for a long time, and now it's just amplified with this current situation. So I think having a really good framework and approaching your work, I think is important. And in moments of crisis, it helps you, it helps ground you in, in values and, and vision, um, particularly when everything's changing so quickly and you know things are being thrown at you and there's a lot of pressure to make quick, quick decisions. Um, I think it's important to have that grounding and framework to, to guide your work like in, in what matters and, and who you're trying to, like whose lives are you trying to better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen something about, um, I don't know if anybody from SFMTA is participating, but I know that they um, used, I believe they have something like an equity network um, or something that they had established even pre-COVID um, that they're using now to kind of use as a framework of, you know, about where to reallocate their service right now, um, where it'd be most efficient and most needed, um, which is again, you know, that's something that they even had going before this all started. and. Um, definitely gave them a head start, I would imagine. Um, so I guess along the lines of equity, um, this is a question from the participants, um, open to anyone, open to you know all of you to answer, um, but how have you considered in your projects the needs of riders with disabilities? Um, I assume that that has been you know, a consideration, whether it's with the platform level boarding um, that you guys did on 14th Street, um, as a way to build more cohesion across paratransit and non-paratransit service um, is the question that we received. Yeah, so at Indigo, we have a what we call a mobility advisory committee, um, and that is specifically targeted around uh, riders uh, with disabilities. And so we work really heavy with them. Um, we're also, uh, in all of our big capital projects, we kind of do an ADA, uh, ADA preview day if you will, um, to get feedback uh, on design. One of the things we did uh, on the red line is, you know, we, we'd already kind of vetted this with our, uh, our mobility advisory committee at Indigo, and the city of Indianapolis also has an equivalent uh, committee. And we went through a lot of the features of the project uh, to make sure that whatever was designed would, you know, work well for those with disabilities. Um, but we are um, basically always monitoring and continuing the, the, the conversation with accessibility because it's not only the physical uh, aspects of the infrastructure, but it's also the, the tools that are there for information access, uh, whether that's someone who you know, has low vision or blind and needs to use a screen reader and making sure that all of our documents and our, all of our uh, information is available and consumable in a format that works for, for uh, everyone. Jeff or Linda? It, yeah, I think from our end, when we implement any of our transfer winning projects, uh, we make sure everything's vetted through our accessibility folks at DOT as well as MTA. Uh, they typically manage that outreach to, to the community uh, on that end, but we implement a lot of tactical warning strips, uh, our, our real time passenger information signage um, has a, an audio component, all the off board fare payment has has Braille and audio component of that. So we're certainly sensitive to that. I think from the, the, the quick and dirty implementations, the, the, the bus borders, the uh, painting the roadbed and, and, um, and a tan paint to represent the sidewalk instead of, instead of uh, uh, driving space. Uh, we still have some work to do and how we're doing that. We do the liquid dome uh, tackle warning strips there. There's, there's some progress we need to be made. I think that, um, is sort of a blind spot in how AGs, agencies respond uh, uh, quickly and, and, and efficiently in, in, in times like this. And if we're going to stand up 
uh, bike lanes or bus lanes with cones or, or, or temporary barriers. How are we signifying that to folks who are visually impaired uh, or hearing impaired where the, that, that curb line is now moved or where they can stand behind a parked vehicle as they waited to, to cross the street and that, that parking is now gone. Uh, that, that is something we definitely uh, will keep an eye on and are keeping an eye on going forward here. But, um, could do better on. <laughs> Um, I could say something briefly. I think um, being being thoughtful about the language you use and also thinking about, um, I always say that I think when, when we're missing something, it's, I think oftentimes not because of malice, but it's because there's not enough people in your ear kind of giving you different perspectives from like different people's lived experiences. Um, like for example, uh, thinking about the, the ask for rear door boarding, um, I think it was brought up that I mean, that is definitely something that's going to be helping protect, protect the like bus drivers. And but how are we also thinking about, well, you know, people with wheelchairs um, might not necessarily have be able to access a rear, a rear door. And how are we also kind of uh, incorporating different uh, lived experiences that might not necessarily be able to access um, those kind of policies? And because they're still going to have to be using the, the front kind of the front door entrance of the bus. Um, so I think thinking about when we're talking about policies, um, how are we considering the different ways people move around and are we thinking about all those different people? Um, and if we're not, well, who are, who do we need to bring to the table to be able to offer more of those perspectives? I think that's something I always try to keep in mind because I, I definitely don't have all the angles or all the perspectives. Um, but if I feel like I'm missing something, um, I'll think about who else, who else do I need to bring to the table that can offer that nuance. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we've gotten, I'm just going to kind of break um, to respond to somebody who asked if there are shared resources that cities are using right now um, about emergency protocols and transit innovation projects. Um, Jeff, it looks like he shared in the chat. Um, NACTO has definitely been compiling. Um, they have an emergency response kind of whole web page setup um, and web interface. Um, I believe APTA is as well. Um, we, as in street plans, we've also been compiling more of um, more data on things like open streets. We got a, um, a question about that as well and temporary bikeways and that sort of thing. So I can also share that link. Um, you know, it's an open spreadsheet um, that we're sharing and all you have to do is request access if anyone's interested um, in that. Uh, so that's just um, to address that, those two questions here. And then, so to take it away from COVID, just for a second, um, we have a question here about what would it take to go fare free? Um, and if there is, you know, are there, what are the kind of the cost benefit trade-offs to going, you know, free for all or free according to market or segment? Um, and have any of you guys, you know, is that has been some, has that been something that your agencies have discussed? Um, or Linda, how, how have you guys kind of grappled with, do we go fare free, discounted, um, et cetera? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, it, it has been brought up in Indianapolis and at Indigo. Um, you know, one of our, our pure cities, Kansas City, is uh, looking into, I think that they probably got the most attention for looking into a plan to go fare free. Um, you know, we just, our fare box recovery ratio is somewhere around 13 to 15%. So, um, you know, not super high, but not the lowest it could be. Um, you know, for us, we are really concentrating on making sure that we have better service and more service. Um, it, you know, it's nice to have a free bus, but if the free bus still only runs once an hour, um, how useful is that really? And so we've been getting a lot of feedback um, that people, you know, are just want to have, you know, more frequency and better uh, service span uh, and improved amenities at bus stops. And, and that is a higher priority, at least for now, um, than free fares, obviously, with COVID. That this presents a different dimension to this conversation and what happens in our new reality. Um, but that's why we chose to focus on kind of the, the, the fare capping and introducing that. Uh, we're also introducing a retail network uh, with 400 locations around the city so that people could go reload fare or purchase fare in right in their neighborhoods for those who couldn't access one of our, our one of our existing locations where people need to go to, to uh, reload fare cards or get fare cards. Uh, so yeah, for us, uh, there's also a political component 
um, of that and figuring out where the budget would come uh, to fund, uh, make up for the, the revenue loss and fare. Uh, so there, there's just a lot of complexities for that and I'm sure it's different for each city to consider, but that's where we're at in Indianapolis. Nice. Um, I can go. Um, yeah, so the Active Transportation Alliance um, has been calling for free transit, partly just thinking about the, the, the different issues that we're facing, particularly in black and brown communities in Chicago, um, disproportionately impacted by um, unemployment, disproportionately impacted by um, cases and COVID-19 deaths. Um, like currently Latinx communities, um, current report this week showed that they're being impacted the most um, with cases and with deaths. Um, so thinking about the different people, the different experience people are, um, are facing in their communities and free transit, I think seems um, adequate just given the need for social distancing in addition to acknowledging that um, people's incomes are drastically different than they were a couple months ago. Um, but acknowledging that's also very challenging. Um, CTA has made no moves to implement anything of the sort, though they're being very lax with fair enforcement and moving to uh, have uh, rear door fare card readers. Um, and I think part of that work is um, acknowledging that the fare box recovery ratio is a huge barrier in Chicago. It's 50%. Um, so it's, it's just very, it's significant. Uh, it's a significant barrier. And in our fair fares report, we outlined how that needs to be reevaluated um, because something like free transit um, becomes, or just a conversation about discounted fares um, becomes significantly more challenging. Um, so I think it's it's an equitable response at the very least, discounted fares for low-income residents, um, but there are definitely challenges to get there. Um, I think framing it around um, human rights, I think, it, or like public good is something that I've been thinking about, just the messaging around it, um, particularly with uh, the issues that people are facing right now. I think if we are able to frame the conversation around like a public good, um, especially for people that need to be moving around, um, I think that's something that could help um, advance the conversation forward, it's something that people have the right to, the right to movement. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have a question here about um, any examples of how New York City, Chicago, or, in, or Indy um, are addressing drive-in testing centers, um, since um, a lot of, you know, testing centers right now are not really allowing bike up, walk up, bus up um, testing. So, you know, what are any of, you know, are, are, are any of your cities um, exploring, you know, making testing more accessible just for people who have to ride transit? Um, and then I guess also, you know, for anyone just without a car in general. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Obviously, this is really huge during this, this crisis. We've seen a lot of drive through this, drive to pick up that. Um, um, so definitely, uh, we're fortunate in Indianapolis that uh, through the partnership with the state and working with um, a few other uh, local organizations that we're opening up a few test sites that will actually be along some of our, our frequent bus routes. Um, and so that'll be really, really helpful to allow people to be able to, to reach those locations. So um, we're just fortunate that, that that's being addressed and that that was something that um, was identified as a need uh, based on the, the, you know, push from the city and, and working together with the state to make sure that that happens. So we are going to have uh, at least two, if not three locations people can access by our frequent transit that exists on the ground today. Nice. And I'm, I'm not really plugged into what's going on with the, the testing here in New York. I, it did leave me scratching my head a little bit when I saw drive through testing facilities and most people in New York City don't own cars. Uh, I heard stories about people being told to take Ubers and stick your head out the window. Um, they, they, I know they're addressing it through through more neighborhood testing centers. I, I don't have a lot of specifics on that. Tune in to Cuomo's daily press briefing on CNN and see if he talks about it. But yeah, they, they are looking to get that into more neighborhoods so you can have walk-up service. Mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't heard a lot about particularly um, trend, uh, how to make it more accessible to transit riders. Um, I have been I, I have been asking people more about those questions, like how do you make testing accessible to people? And 
I've been thinking about how we can adapt some of the dominant conversations around like transportation right now, for example, like open streets. Um, how, how is that com conversation adapting to, well, okay, like, can we talk about uh, these kind of open streets ideas in context of creating more, more uh, avenues for people to access testing, which is an immediate need and a need that's going to exist, it seems like, for a long time. Um, so I, I think that's something I've been trying to think about. Like, what are we currently working on, and what are the what are the where are the cur current conversations on, and how can we tie those into um, uh, creating avenues for like essential services for people right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of a perfect tie into another question that we have. Um, obviously, I'm sure a lot of you know transportation and transit professionals. Who are listening in um, and watching have heard about you know what cities are doing with their streets um, reconfiguring lanes to um, create temporary bike lanes open streets and shared streets um, but specifically you know do you guys have any thoughts on um, how you know the opportunities to actually create synergy between transit and these alternative modes specifically right now um, you know, to make it easier for not just social distancing, but also for essential workers to safely get to their jobs. Are your cities implementing any of these strategies? And if not, you know, what do you see to, um, what do you see as the barriers to doing so? Well, in Indianapolis, uh, our, our mayor has been evaluating um, situations. We, have a, we do have crowding on some of the streets downtown, um, a lot of pedestrian activity, and especially a lot of, a lot of our trails and greenways, um, which are all still open, um, are, are seeing definitely an uptick when the weather's nice. Uh, but there are no formal plans to shut down streets uh, or open up streets to pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, I will say one thing um, from a personal standpoint that I'm trying to stop doing is calling anything that's biking, cycling, or walking alternative. Uh, I think using the word alternative uh, kind of gives it uh, this otherness and that it may be less superior to you know, auto-centric uh, mode of transport. And so it's really important that we think about the language that we use. And in this time where we have a lot of people that are walking, maybe that didn't normally walk in different parts of the city or their neighborhood or, or biking on streets that they weren't normally able to bike on because of less traffic, um, hopefully for those people, if they weren't already um, really clued into the urbanist conversation that they're, uh, you know, we're using this opportunity for them to experience that and see how they might want their city to be different or what they might want different in the, in the new reality on the other side of this in terms of uh, space for people. So here in New York, we were a little slow to implement that. There was a, there was a large push from the, from the community, from the electeds. Uh, the press to to open something up. We are, we're now committed to doing 100 miles. Uh, the first they announced more today. I, know, I may get the mileage wrong. I think it's up to around 10 miles, 12 miles. Um, as we go, we're going to be rolling out more as as, as time goes on. Each, each week, it's going to have more mileage. Um, in terms of of connecting how folks get to and from work and school and other places as the city turns back on, there's conversations going on. Um, Again, we're pulling from our existing uh, toolkit of, of, of bus lanes, of sidewalk expansions, of public plazas, of standing up protected uh, bike lanes. Some temporary bike lanes have already gone into place. So there are conversations happening in our agency and other agencies and uh, throughout city leadership of, of how to do that. New York is a notoriously congested city, both from a traffic standpoint, pedestrian standpoint, and parts of the city, especially Manhattan. Um, our transit is, is crowded. Uh, as the city turns back on in waves, I think it'll be easier to adapt and, and learn from what we've done and then grow where we need to grow in that. Uh, but yeah, we're pulling, pulling from lessons that we've learned from ourselves and other parts of our city and other projects we've done as well as what other cities across the world are doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, I think something that I've been thinking about is how I think among, I think some rhetoric that I've been hearing around um, like kind of open streets and just opening up streets for like cyclists and, and walking. And um, I, I think it's important not to see transit as kind of sacrificial, which I think I've been hearing more. Well, transit's gonna be unsafe for a long time. We're all gonna have to transition to like walking and biking. And um, I think it, it, the, some of the rhetoric is, I would say um, somewhat dangerous because I think 
I mean, transit has to be part of this larger network that we, that we see as integral to our cities, um, regardless of this pandemic. I think we just have to adapt um, to changing circumstances and think about how transit has to adapt to those needs of social distancing. So I think it's really important to think about how we're like talking about these things and how to see how to see walking, biking and transit as working um, in cohesion. Because um, I, I don't know if the conversation right now is um, looking at like I, I, the way I've been hearing has has really um, seen it in that way. And I think it's important for us to continue to I think um, these things don't have to be in conflict with each other. I mean, we can more people can be walking and biking, but that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be transitioning from using uh, like buses or trains. Um, so I, I think yeah, I think it's important to just be mindful of how, how we're framing this in the conversation and how to continue to see transit as a public good for people. Nice. Great. Well, I think that's a good point to end on. Um, so we are at time. Um, again, appreciate all of you guys being on as our panelists. I also appreciate this opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Um, really want to thank the Shared Use Mobility um, and all of you guys who joined us. Um, hopefully you learned something from this conversation and you can check out some of the resources that we um, suggested. And yeah, hopefully everyone has a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.